Hey, this is Mead here. This is going to be a, another real-time uh, landscape painting demo. And we're going to stay in grayscale for this one and focus on getting our layout right. The stage that we're going to begin with basically requires that you cover the surface as quickly as possible to establish some, base, some basic shapes. And what we're going to do is focus on the foreground, middle ground, and background shapes. And if you can break them down into three shapes, that's kind of the best, um, at least to start with. You can then subdivide shapes and then add more as you go along in stage two. But for this stage, we're going to keep it fairly simple, and we're going to focus on just the foreground, middle ground, and background layers. Um, generally speaking, you combine those with darker values, middle values, and lighter values. And depending on how confident you are, you can uh, use lesser or greater contrast. Typically, I find that low contrast works pretty well for most of the time. And keeping the, the value in the middle works pretty well. Um, you'll see in this video that I kind of paint fairly slow. And I tend to focus on trying to stay simple. But I want to be very specific about the edges of each layer. When you paint, you can really start anywhere and then start in any method. But this is just one way to begin. Um, it's a good option. So here I'm actually starting with a middle ground shape because I find that the middle ground shape is fairly distinctive for this one. Um, that patch of... of lighter value is eventually going to wind up being the background shape but it needs a little bit more refinement uh, when I cut in with the sky value later so typically an easy way to begin would be to to start back to front begin with the sky do the background do the middle ground do the foreground but you don't have to paint like that it's just one way to begin And as I develop these layers, I'm always thinking, okay, I need to be specific to what I'm painting and I need to simplify it down so that it's clear, understandable, and readable. One of the other things that um, I find people have trouble with is this first layer paint application most of the time it's either too thin or too thick. What we want to do is have a paint application that really covers the canvas or the surface that you're painting on, in this case paper. We want it to be completely opaque. We don't want to see the transparency of, of the paint on this layer. On upper layers it's great to do transparency but not on this beginning layer. The other thing is we want to keep it as thin as possible while maintaining that, that opacity. What will happen if you paint too thickly is you'll get physical texture built up on this first layer. And that physical texture is going to leave ridges, it's going to leave marks, and those marks are probably ones that you won't want to end up in your final painting. You know, you want your top layers to have a little more texture if you're going to paint in a textural fashion. So I just want you to be aware of that and start thinking about it as you paint. Um, be sure you use enough medium, but not too much. I find that if you're painting in acrylic, like I am, if you use water, then it tends to get too transparent and too thin. So if you use one of the painting mediums like uh, like matte medium or fluid matte medium, you know, even gloss medium or satin medium is fine. Um, as long as you're using an acrylic medium, it'll maintain the the paint a little bit better. It'll the paint will be the pigments will be even more like evenly distributed. Water tends to break the paint apart and make it clump a little bit more. So that's just something to be aware of as you build these things up. Um, 
so I'm going for more of an extreme contrast thing. I don't know if any of these values are, are like correct by any means yet. What I'm focusing on now is just the shape of the foreground, middle ground, and background. And this one's going to be sort of a strange one because there's this extreme foreground with trees kind of blocking a little bit of the view. And then the middle ground is extremely far away and the background is very, very far away. So that's something that's a little bit funky about the reference that I'm using and the situation, but it is fairly common that you get separation like this. Um, other landscapes, they may have more uh, more of a close-up middle ground or, or more transition between foreground and middle ground. What I'm thinking with the foreground, usually, is that it has to not draw too much attention. Um, and it kind of has to frame out the middle ground and begin the process of overlap. When you're painting almost any realistic scene or landscape, overlap tends to be the main the main thing that you're concerned with because it's the easiest way to create depth. And typically depth is what we're after in any kind of realistic painting. So you notice that I'm using like various brush marks and paying attention to the edge. And right now I'm using a, uh, f a fairly large brush. This is only an eight by 10 inch painting I'm using a one inch brush. And that means that I can cover a lot of ground really quickly on your first layer. Typically you're going to have, you're going to pick out your biggest brush. A lot of painters, they paint with a huge brush the entire time. And I think that's really great because it keeps you, approximating it keeps you simple keeps things uh, clear and readable and it simplifies your whole job one of the other things too is that if you don't know what the outer edge of the shape really needs to be like you can kind of begin somewhere within the shape and then work your way out to the edge um, and if you go too far, that's okay, because chances are you have some of the other colors mixed up. And if not, then you can make corrections on the second pass through the piece. Because what you're going to do is make multiple passes and make um, adjustments as you go along. So here I need to get the sky in. I'm just choosing a value that's um, in the middle and just different than the other values. It doesn't have to be correct at this point um, because I I kind of know for um, or have a good instinct at this point that especially the background value is going to be wrong and it's going to need some adjustment. So what I need to do though is I need to cover the canvas and I need to eliminate pure white so that I know what everything is going to look like in relation to each other. Um, and I think that that's kind of your main concern at this stage. Once you cover the canvas, then you can start making some judgments about how dark and how light each thing should be. There we go. That move kind of created a tangent, so that's going to have to get adjusted later. So yeah, a lot of this is just, at this point, you know, once you have focused on these edges. A lot of this is just, you know, covering the canvas, filling in, 
and making sure that you have like a good even paint application. Focusing on the edge and kind of using large areas of flat paint um, takes away a lot of the decision making, removes a lot of the pressure, and it kind of gives you a mental break. You know, if you focused on the edge for a long time, then you have a large area to fill. You can take a break and just kind of mechanically go through the motions, right? You don't have to be thinking too hard about what you're doing at this point. You know, now we're into stage two. So what we need to do here is make adjustments and add more shapes. So the first adjustment that I figured out I, I should begin with is I need to lighten up the sky uh, and begin to create a sky gradient. Basically what I, what I find in skies is that most of the time for many of the lighting conditions out there, at the sort of bottom of the page, the bottom of the sky, um, it's going to be lighter than at the top. And in this situation, what I tried, what I'm trying to do is create a relationship between the background layer and the sky. And I want to get their level of contrast uh, figured out kind of together. So what you need to do is mix these two colors right around at the same time um, and keep them wet if possible. Um, if you're painting in oil, it's no big deal. But if you're painting in gouache or acrylic, you know, you really want to try to keep these together so that you can mix and, and adjust and make changes if you need to. Because typically what's going to happen is the background and the sky usually are going to have a very low amount of contrast relative to each other. Here I'm just kind of slowly darkening that sky value. One of the things that you'll notice is a lot of the time when I paint an edge, I don't use the brush along to go along the edge. See, I'm kind of painting at an angle to it or even just directly away from an edge. I feel like that gives you more control over what these edges look like. Um, if you kind of go along an edge, it's always going to be a sharp edge and might leave ridges that you don't want later. Eventually, realistic painting, when you get everything, all of the techniques and out of the way and you kind of know what you're doing, um, everything just becomes about edge control and edge handling. Um, it's kind of the main concern after a while is, you know, how hard and how soft is an edge. And you want a good mixture, you know, you need edges that are soft and edges that are really sharp. Um, and you want that to kind of go through most of your painting. Now here, um, I'm going to begin to add more shapes into this painting. And there's, um, there's basically two ways that you can add shapes at this point. One way is you can begin to work, um, with light and shadow. And the other way is you can add more layers within the foreground, middle ground, and background layers. Like you can have two, three, or four middle ground layers. You could have a bunch of foreground layers. You could have a bunch of background layers. Um, and basically what you do is you mix up a different value that's related to the value scheme within any one of those sections. And you paint another flat layer in between it as if you're taking another paper cutout and layering it um, in front of and or behind other layers. So here you can see that this is adding another flat layer into the middle ground. So this isn't operating as light and shadow, right? but it is giving me another shape to work with. So here, um, this is going to be the opposite. This, um, or this is going to be the other method. So this, what I'm going in with, is going to be more about light and shadow. Uh, 
So I've mixed something slightly darker than that middle ground layer. And I'm going to go in and paint the shadow areas that I see uh, based on what I see in the reference. So this gives me another way to subdivide and relate shapes to each other. And I need to stay in the middle ground. I need to stay fairly low contrast. Um, if I go too high contrast, it's going to pull it too far forward visually and it's going to make things a little bit awkward. So here I'm going back to the the other method where I'm going to have to add in another middle ground layer. So what I do is I go back to that same idea. I focus on the edge. I have a flat color. I'm going to paint a whole section in this flat color. Now, one of the things that I have to do is I have to overpaint what's in the foreground layer a little bit, which is totally okay. Um, one of the things that I can't do is leave a little gap where you see the previous col uh, color value um, at you know, kind of ringing the edge of that foreground shape. So I have to paint right up to it, maybe over it a little bit. If I paint over it, then I just have to come back and restate the foreground layer which I'm going to have to do anyway. So it's not really a big deal to do that. So what this does, so what this has done is this has given me another, um, another layer to work with in that middle ground. Here in the background, I've mixed up another, uh, another value just to adjust the background because it's a little bit it's a little bit too light. <clears throat> I probably want the sky to be lighter than the background for the most part. And you'll notice what I do all the time is when I'm testing out a new value or a new color, I'll dot the area, maybe spread it out a little bit and see if it's right. If it's not, then I go ahead and make adjustments. And every time I make a pass through, just like I do in drawing, I'm re-observing and adjusting one more time. So every time you go through the painting again, you have this ability to make changes to the shapes and uh, make everything more accurate to the way you want it or more lively or interesting. Again, I have to be sure that I completely cover areas. And here I'm actually going to wind up subdividing the background a little bit so that I get another layer in between the far background and the, and the near background. There we go. The other thing is that at this stage for layout, mostly I'm painting um, with hard edges or at least harder edges. Um, you know, on the more finishing layers, if I were to add color to this, then I would need to come in and probably um, work on my, my edge quality a little bit more and add more sharp edges. It's just that um, working with sharp edges allows you to use um, overall less contrast. And I feel like that's really beneficial when you're beginning a layout like this. Yeah, I'm just being careful to fill shapes in completely, make adjustments and 
change any shapes that I need to. Then, because I lost a lot of contrast between the sky value, I need to go back and readjust the sky and create a better contrast relationship between that background and the sky. Now the background has a better relationship with the middle ground. It's not so different. So now I'm just adjusting the relationship of the sky to the background because it's very close, but the sky is just a little bit lighter. And it takes a while, you know, you have to slow down and mix carefully and then, um, you know, paint fairly carefully along the edges and maintain your awareness as you go through this process. Um, one of my students at the moment, um, you know, paints really quickly, but they also mix really quickly. And what we try to, what we try to do for them is, um, we try to make a little change where you mix slowly, paint quickly. Um, and that allows you a little bit more thinking time. Um, as you're painting, you're always constantly evaluating, thinking and making changes. Don't make judgments, you know, don't say this is good or this is bad. If, uh, you gotta avoid that. Otherwise things can get, uh, you know, too negative too quickly. You want to say, you know, is this too dark? Is this too light? Those kinds of thoughts, because those are constructive and those are ones that you can uh, change and fix. Um, you know, do I increase contrast? Do I decrease contrast? Do I change the overall shape? Um, do I keep it the same? Um, am I ready to move on to the next stage and so on? That's more where your head should be at. It's a little bit um, more productive that way too. So here, I'm actually starting to break up the sky um, and indicate where there might be some clouds. Might make the shapes just a little more, bit more interesting. I feel like the clouds are always a good source of soft edges if you don't have a lot of um, a lot of soft edges in your painting. Um, that way you can get a little bit more um, variety to the mark making that you use. What you want to do still is keep your sky relatively low contrast compared to everything else. Um, the sky is kind of this, you know, plane that goes from far background up to foreground if you look just above you. Usually the sky goes from far background to middle ground um, in, in the way that most images are structured. Um, if you had an extremely low horizon, maybe the sky could even come into the foreground, depending on how close or far the foreground is from you. Um, but that really, that really depends. So you want to maintain similar contrast ranges as background and middle ground. So here I'm making another adjustment to the background, bringing it closer to the middle ground and adding an actual um, shadow onto there. And at the same time, I also added a little gradient within the background so that it feels like there's kind of like light spilling in the bottom of the valley there. So here we're entering kind of this last stage of the layout where I've laid out everything. I'm kind of happy with where the shapes are. And now I can go into lighting and um, that's where things get, get pretty interesting. 
because now we break down our shapes into even smaller segments. So what I find is that your foreground, middle ground, background tend to be your big shapes as well as your sky. Your medium shapes tend to be the subdivisions within those those shapes and your small shapes tend to be um, where your light and shadow patterns go. So if you go through all three of those phases, um, it's going to help you begin to think about and balance out big, medium, and small shapes too, which is really important to do uh, in your in your painting. Um, if you have only small shapes, it's too chaotic. If you have only big shapes, it's a little bit boring. But if you mix everything up, then um, things get pretty interesting to look at, both from a distance and from up close. And this stage is really where you want to slow down because you can still make changes to the edges. Um, you want to be very careful about your mixtures, make sure that they're as low contrast as they need to be to stay within the foreground, middle ground, and background um, value ranges. And I also find that, you know, the some of the most interesting light patterns and shadow patterns tend to happen in the middle ground. It's not always the case, but, you know, I've been focusing recently on, on creating interesting middle grounds. Um, and I think that's been really productive um, as far as creating um, you know, interesting paintings. I tend to leave the foreground and background relatively simple lately. Um, you could also do uh, more complex um, more complex foregrounds um, with interesting lighting situations, but typically focal points tend to land in the middle ground anyway. So that's where you want to spend a lot of your um, time and attention. And remember, we're just keeping it very specific and we're simplifying down. You know, we can't put every little, um, every little piece of gritty shadow into the whole piece. Um, otherwise, uh, we'd be sitting there with a single bristle brush for hours. So we're always trying to approximate and simplify things, but we need to keep it specific to the reference that we're using, to the thing that we're painting. There we go. You know, you have two ways to do this, you know, depending on how dark or how light you've keyed each shape. Some of them you could be painting in the shadows and some of them you could be painting in the lights. It really depends on how you've structured the painting so far. Just working carefully through it. There we go. Again, we're going to keep it fairly simple and stop relatively soon. We're nearing the end. If you watched this far in the video and you've enjoyed it, consider subscribing to the channel and keeping in contact with me. As always, if you got any questions, you can post them in the comments and I'll respond. Um, I'm always open to requests and suggestions for further videos, and I uh, absolutely appreciate all of your time, and I hope this really helps you on your painting journey. And here, we're going to carry it out to the end, and... Uh, We'll sign off now.